Welcome back to the space here <clears throat> in this morning sitting time together. As you come to let your eyes close, and seeing if you can spend a little time really gently welcoming this deepening sensitivity to these streams of experience, each of the bodily sensitivities, as well as the realms of the heart and mind. getting a sense of what our starting place is in this moment. In terms of the character of these experiences. I think it can be always helpful as we tune into the stream of sound or the realms of physicality to not take for granted the perspective the position, the screen from which and by which and through which this knowing is taking place. So sounds are arising and passing visual impressions are arising and passing, tastes and smells, and body sensations. But a lot of how we perceive them, how we interpret those experiences is influenced profoundly by the qualities that are also arising and passing in the realm of the heart and mind. We cannot assume it's neutral observational standpoint. It's helpful to sometimes see the ways in which the quality that might be arisen in the mind at this moment is affecting, coloring our interpretation of what we notice in the body. If 
feeling certain thoughts, impressions. And part of our object is simply to observe these just as we're observing sensations in the body, sensations of sound and sight. And then knowing itself not outside of the realm of what is observed. related to equally. And so while we will encourage a primary anchoring of the intention, in some part of the experience that's a little more tangible, like the body, sensations throughout or where the hands are touching. Or the sensations of movement in the area of the abdomen are more apparent. We're still aware of the qualities of mind, the impact they're having on our relationship to the body experience and on the experience of the body itself. And the loop through awareness that that creates back in the mind. And so we try to build the sense of concurrent attention with the primary field of experience, the body, hands, breath, sound. Because being able to watch something over time is ultimately the key to the observational insights into the nature of all phenomena. It takes practice and patience, concentration, calm. So we try to watch one thing one field of things but the insight can happen anywhere since all conditioned phenomena are of the same nature and character to arise and pass dependent upon conditions whether it's in the mind or sound, the body, sight, smell or taste. So we don't get disturbed when the attention wanders. We take it as an opportunity to observe thought, emotion, liking, disliking, wanting, not wanting. But because the mind is so ethereal, it 
we still will encourage the coming back into sound or the body. To anchor the attention in something more tangible. But even in that, keeping some capacity for mindfulness of the mind in relationship to the body. So when we gather the attention at the abdomen to watch the breath, we can notice if there's a constriction, a forcing, a tension in the mind that we're creating. As we build the sense and capacity of concentration, are we applying a painful pressure onto the mind? Are we applying pressure onto the future? Trying to get something? Expecting satisfaction from some future moment of concentration, some future moment of mindfulness? of relief. Do we see the wanting in that? Do we see the pain of that? And with this sense of kindness, compassion, tenderness and wisdom, Relaxing the mind again. Settling back into just what has arisen right now and following it through its full course, its birth, life, and death. With every breath, every sound, every physical sensation, every moment of awareness.
Um, I just wanted to offer a few encouragements around the um, interview process, um, but really even for for actually just our practice, but in reference to that, um, you know, we're very accustomed, and I know most of you are also to having uh, check-ins with the teacher that are very, um, you know, kind of casual and um, from this basic frame of reference of, you know, how are you doing? How are things going? <laughs> um, you know, what's happening? What's hard? What's easy? What are some questions? from the basic frame of reference of our normal perspective on our lives, who we are, what's happening, you know, as, as people who are on retreat to varying degrees, uh, um, making decisions, having things happen to us, going through the day. And um, I just really want to encourage everyone, full-time, part-time yogis, to take a look at the uh, Mahasi reporting instructions that are available on the Academy website if you haven't already, uh, or if even if you're familiar with it, to take a, another look at it. Um, it's a an approach to the check-in interview process that um, we find a lot of meaning in and have a lot of confidence in. Um, and don't have an agenda with any of you to, to pursue. Um, but I think we all feel that it's, it's worth understanding at least the, the premise of it. <clears throat> and for sure, it's always worth practicing the, the method. Um, and um, so just to know that if, if you, you know, during the week and in your interview process, we're, we're happy and enthusiastic to kind of continue with the more, um, casual check-in, talk about practice, talk about ourselves, how we're doing. And we're happy to do, um, to explore with you and train around this, this other particular approach. And it, it doesn't have to even be one or the other because mostly these Mahasi reporting um, experiences are, you know, a couple of minutes long at the most. So there's, there's uh, you know, you can do both if you're interested sometimes people feel that the structure of the formal interview process is a little confining, a little restrictive. It feels so um, like there's a lot of pressure that gets put on our practice to be able to fit it into these terms. And of course, that's why we don't always do that. And we want to avoid that. We don't want to have a sense of adding pressure to anyone's practice or interviews, which already can be sort of stressful and bring up stuff for people, of course. But the important thing to know about it really is that what the, what, the, what the invitation is, is rather than, um, you know, talk about ourselves and our experience in the kind of normal socially agreed upon way, it's trying to break down the reporting and the speaking of experience along the lines at which it's understood that it actually happens. So this sense of like, okay, well, you're noticing rising and falling of the breath, you notice pressure, you notice tension, you notice release, you notice relaxation, you notice a sound arises, you notice an image uh, arises in the mind, you notice a liking or not liking of that idea. You notice that thoughts start to arise about what we're thinking of hearing. You notice you're caught in thought. Oh, we return the attention back to the anchoring of the breath. Um, and there's a, a real momentary kind of precision that starts to develop in terms of understanding the difference between how we experience reality with ourselves at the center, which is the sort of normal way of human and um, at least human life, where the sense of self is really this sort of he hegemonic centralized power or everything is in relationship to it. It positions itself at the center of all that's happening. And that is one way of experiencing reality and life that's um, not untrue. It's just that that perspective is so confining and actually the, the assumptions that are based in there are not not entirely true, and that there are other ways of experiencing this dance between mind and body, 
that don't actually put self at the center, that don't put the mind at the center, that include mind and, and the experience of me-ness and awareness and consciousness in sequential relationship with what's happening at the other sense doors. And there's something very liberating about that. And it's the essence essentially really of, of what this Vipassana practice is designed to show is that if you actually, you tell the story of, oh, you know, I heard this sound outside, it made me upset and I went outside and I yelled at this person for doing whatever. Whereas like, if you were to watch it in the purely Vipassana way and then report on it, you would see that the chain of events are actually the opposite of how we describe it. Oh, I heard this sound. Actually, there is a sound, an object hits the sense door. There's a vibration there, right? There's awareness of sound. There's sound consciousness arises. And then in, you know, so that's this moment of contact between the sense experience, the physical receptor and consciousness of a sound arises. And then there's a chain of events that leads from that, oh, of perception, of identification of, oh, what is that sound? Oh, it's this, an image arises in the mind. A liking or dislike arises of that, a notion arises. There's a, a sense of that smell, uh, that sound, that uh, a coherence of identity arises around that. A liking or not liking arises, an aversion or attachment, and a coherence of meanness arises in response to this other thing. So you see that the me is actually the culmination, the result of the unseen process versus the me at the center to which all these things are happening. And so there's a very real clear reason why the training around the Mahasi approach to interviews is designed to help us start to break down our assumptions of ourselves at the center of how we think everything is happening, how we're trained and have trained ourselves to survive in this way, but to start to break that down in a, in a very kind of methodical and um, very pure kind of clean way. Um, of course, that's not the only way either to experience reality in its many dimensions, but there's a value to it. So just to really encourage, um, you know, checking it out, whether you choose to actually report in that way when you're doing your check-in is totally up to you, um, but it will help you understand the practice, no matter what, of Vipassana and this idea of why we're so focused on momentary concentration, right? Why the sense of like, it's a little bit less oriented towards space and emptiness compared to mo over time and impermanence of experience that, that in any moment there's one experience happening and that changeability of that present moment is um, part of what's so hard, but also the entry point into understanding the nature of things that leads to release. So it's an important tool um, at the very least to understanding why we orient towards practice in this way. And we're totally stoked to, to, to work with anyone uh, to, to um, in your training to the degree that it supports you around it, um, but also not to force it or not to push it. And, and we know that there's times where people, can, it can get too uptight and you're like, oh, we're trying to keep track of each moment. And it creates a sort of tension in the mind, which is the last thing we want to do. So the sense of like where it's helpful, where it might be meaningful, we want to support it, where it feels like it's creating pressure and anxiety, we drop it. Um, but we also want to make sure that you have it as a tool to, to the degree that it's helpful. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Michelle, Steve, do you have anything you want to add about the Mahasi reporting method or instructions or? Darine as well. I know you're not as steeped in it as these guys. I think I could just add that um, I was the type that would find it very anxiety producing and um, how I learned to work with that was that I initially as I would take five minutes a day to do to to attempt to do it like five minutes walking five minutes sitting and so I took all the pressure off and I started learning the the value of it as Jesse's describing and I could um, then I started just uh, bringing my awareness in that way when I could and that could that started to grow 
but if I was trying to do it all day, it was impossible and it became like um, militant <laughs> and, and backfired. So, but I could encourage, you know, there's a range of experience in this group, um, new, newer, medium, older students, um, just like, you know, take in what we're saying really saying that for some of you this will be very helpful for some of you it won't be helpful and they'll be in the middle and just um, please take it as an offering to uh, really deepen your practice if it's helpful it really helps a lot and it backfires when it's pressure mm -hmm. yeah i just i'll really re-encourage that piece of like five minutes of your sitting or a day it's like you know, the report is maybe 20 seconds most of the time. You know, you're not trying to report in that detail for a full hour of, of your sitting. It's like, oh, just the, the 20 seconds that are most clear, you know, or 30 seconds where it's like, okay, you notice, dun, 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 these things happen, maybe five seconds. Um, and we start to see like, oh, it's a very different way of perceiving reality and the nature of all this experience we're going through. Oh, Michelle, you're 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 muted. Your mic is up. Um, interviews, please. If you haven't checked, please check the interview list today. Um, please check every day. Um, I hope you've looked. So yeah, that's it. Yeah. So we'll start have interviews for those who have them today in about a little less than twenty minutes. And um, yeah, I just hope everyone is cruising along in your practice and um yeah we look forward to, for, to checking in more and hearing how things are going right all right aloha Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> good morning. Have a good day. Good to see you all. In the day and in the night, all of you. <laughs>